Yeah, so I'm going to share uh, our research, um, and I'm going to I'm going to give this talk in kind of three parts. The first is kind of one way that we use data. The second is kind of why this stuff works and how we're thinking about using it. And then the third is um, some analyses we've actually done of computational biology as a field. So a little bit more kind of science of science. I've also got the chat window open on the side. So if you want to type a message on the side, I will try to answer it as we go along. Um, I'm also happy to answer questions afterwards, but if there's clarifying questions, it's probably helpful to get them in uh, earlier. So why use everyone else's data? Uh, you know, I think um, I end up reading a fair bit about, um, you know, kind of the history of science and, and kind of others who've thought about sort of science as a process. And um, in the U.S., Vannevar Bush played a key role in really driving uh, the government to invest in science. And um, he has this letter to FDR really laying out the idea behind the National Science Foundation. Uh, and he essentially uses this idea of, you know, exploring the unknown as a major driver for why one should be excited and enthusiastic about science. And this is really what our lab does. You know, we want to take data sets that have been analyzed maybe individually, but never in concert together, put them all together, and then see what we can learn from them. Uh, with the idea being that there's likely to be a lot out there that only becomes apparent when you kind of put them together at this scale. Um, and we use mostly uh, unsupervised methods for a lot of this just to kind of um, help us understand the landscape. So uh, we tend to work from kind of a motivating uh, challenge, like many people. Uh, so the story that I'm going to start with, um, the motivating challenge in this case was that if you want to do an analysis that spanned a gene expression data set, multiple gene expression data sets, this, is, this still is not terribly easy. Um, and it's particularly challenging if you need to compare, say, different tissues or, um, you know, different disease models and tissue samples. And so um, I had a postdoc who joined the group, Jacqueline Taroni, who, um, when she was a PhD student, had worked on approaches using a modular framework. So you can imagine using things like uh, WGCNA or other types of approaches to extract modules. And if you had, say, a gray data set, a purple data set, and a blue data set, you would extract modules from each of them, and then you'd sort of use your expert knowledge about how the system works to try to connect, oh, this module in this data set is the same as that module in that data set. Um, and so this was kind of one way to push this type of project forward. It's just extremely manually uh, intensive because you end up having to use your knowledge as an expert of what these data sets represent and the cell types involved to link these modules. So what uh, Dr. Taroni did when she joined our group as a postdoc was to say, well, you know, wouldn't it be great if I didn't have to sort of manually link these across different diseases and different tissues? What if I just had this reusable module library that I could pull from for every data set? And maybe that module library would be consistent enough that I could use it across uh, very different data sets. Um, and so what she wanted to do was to extract these modules and use them in a rare disease context. So basically, could we get modules that would represent key elements of rare diseases? Um, a challenge with this is, you know, if you want to extract really detailed modules, uh, if you're going to use sort of unsupervised machine learning methods, and you want to go kind of beyond clustering to sort of some of these factorization types of approaches, um, you need a pretty, your, your matrix is going to have a large number of uh, features and a small number of examples in the rare disease context. And this is not the world we, we want to live in, right? With machine learning, we want to have a modest number of really relevant features. And ideally, we want to know those things about sort of as many examples as we possibly can. This is the world we lived in because Jackie was interested in rare diseases where, you know, we can do genome-wide measurements, but, you know, we're really only going to ever have those measurements on about 100 people, regardless of sort of how much money we have, right? It's just sort of a sample availability challenge. And so what she decided was, well, you know, maybe the way to do this is to, to create this module library is to make machine learning modules that would work for many biological contexts, essentially any biological context. And then the rare disease context that we're looking at is not sort of a unique case that we have to build a module library for. We can just use the general purpose library. And since this is our group, we love to sort of look at what's out there in the publicly available uh, transcriptomic data. And uh, if you look at what's downloadable now, if you're Lego Grace Hopper and you have an internet connection, uh, we think there's about 4 million gene expression samples across all the various repositories that hold these. Um, if you want to think about what that would cost to generate in your own lab, uh, if you happen to spend, you know, thinking that some of these are clinical, some are going to be more time consuming to generate, some will be less time consuming, reagent costs will be variable. Our back of the envelope was, you know, including person time and everything else, it's maybe $1,000 a sample. So that's a $4 billion uh, resource right there. And uh, I don't think there's that many labs that have $4 billion in research funding to just go out and generate this type of data um, de novo. Uh, 
So really, if you're Lego Grace Hopper, we recommend downloading it. And that's what we do. Um, and so once you can download all that data, uh, you can then build a matrix of genes by many, many, many samples. Uh, what Jackie uh, expected was that the biological meaning, biologically meaningful patterns for rare diseases, including cell type information, could be learned from this type of sort of generic data downloaded from the internet. Uh, you'd then get these patterns. These patterns would be reusable. Some would be relevant for the rare disease, some wouldn't be. So then you take these patterns into your rare disease data set, you look at the expression level of those patterns, and you examine which patterns are potentially associated with an outcome that you care about, you know, maybe case control status um, or sort of disease severity. Uh, you could ask, where are you going to get the training data for this? Uh, we started uh, with this resource, uh, Recount2, which was produced um, by Jeff Leake's group uh, at Johns Hopkins. Uh, it's about 70,000 RNA-seq samples. You know, if you want to think about what this data set would have cost for us to generate at about $1,000 a sample, you're talking about a $70 million data set. Uh, I also, do, just like I don't have $4 billion in research funding, I also don't have $70 million in research funding. And even if I did, I'm not sure the best way to use it is to sequence a bunch of samples, uh, at least not that many samples of generic human stuff. Uh, so you know, this is, again, a unique resource. And if you want sort of pre-prepared data, these types of sort of agglomerations are really helpful. So there's Recount2, there's another one from Avi Mayan's group called Arches, um, and then the Childhood Cancer Data Lab, where I'm actually sitting in right now, has produced one called Refine.bio um, that has compendia you can download that are similar in structure. Um, all of these have pretty similar properties. They're largely just generated with different methods. Um, so if you use a certain method in your group, like you know, Salmon or Callisto or um, Recount2 is Rail, um, you can uh, likely find a comparable sort of public compendium if you're interested. The uh, method that we applied is something from Maria Shakina's group. This actually just came out in Nature Methods, I believe end of last year or beginning of this year, actually last year. Um, Plier is this really nice um, approach to do this factor, to sort of solve this factorization challenge. Um, it, you can think of it essentially as matrix factorization with a few constraints. Um, one is um, it really, if there's a kind of way to align a feature to a pathway, there's a slight boost for aligning to pathways or a uh, you know, lack of a penalty. Um, and that we find is really helpful for making the model interpretable. So you can think about these models as essentially having arbitrary rotations and being able to sort of force them to align or encourage them to align to pathways often leads to a rotation that we find to be much more interpretable. Um, and then there's some other sparsity elements that also aid in interpretability. But if you just wanted to think about this as matrix factorization with some bells and whistles, that's one way you could think about it. Um, so essentially, we're going to learn these factors, or in this case, latent variables. And then um, what Dr. Taroni contributed was to make machine learning models for many biological contexts. She was going to take recount two, sort of this generic collection of human data. Uh, run plier over it to get this sort of collection. And the idea of sort of putting plier together with all this human data, we called multiplier. It's everything in computational biology needs a name. Um, this animation is not going to work because I'm trying out some new software today. Uh, <laughs> but um, I'll take you through this. I think it's just going to be slightly uh, obscured by some words. Um, so uh, first, we can ask how this model works against some comparison sets. So what I'm showing you here, uh, this bar on the left is recount two. So this is sort of generic human data downloaded from the internet. The, the um, box plot uh, portion is the same size as this data set. So this data set is if you downloaded all the whole blood data for lupus, um, what you would get uh, in terms of model uh, performance according to various metrics that I'll tell you about. Where you see the diamond, the diamond in this case is if you use the complete set of recount two data. So these two data sets are the same size. Uh, these two data sets are the different size, but the same composition. And we can ask uh, how many uh, total things we learn. So how many latent variables can we extract? With the disease specific data, we actually extract more latent variables. Um, and you can barely see this probably, it's pretty faded underneath this uh, thing, but you can extract more latent variables um, than you do with the generic data at the same data set size. But if you have the full collection of data, you can still extract more. So this makes sense, right? You, your data is probably noisier if it's just random stuff downloaded from the internet. Um, but on the other hand, even though it's noisier, uh, you have so much more of it, you kind of have power to extract more things. Uh, I won't belabor the point on this slide because all of these are in the uh, paper, uh, which is now published. Um, but I'll just say uh, the pathway coverage of the model, we, we can we can identify more pathways as transcriptionally co-regulated um, when we have more data, which is probably not terribly surprising again. Um, and one of the things that was intriguing to us is that if you match the data set size, 
Um, actually, the generic human data has a larger fraction of latent variables are associated with pathways, suggesting that you know, you're not just learning an enormous number of technical artifacts and that's driving the number. Um, but if you have a huge number of uh, samples, so this diamond, which you can probably barely see down here, but can find in the paper, um, you can actually, you actually learn a lot more features that do not align with a known annotated pathway in the databases that we used. Um, so these two pieces of evidence taken together suggest that there might be some transcriptional co-regulation uh, that is maybe not fully annotated in the public databases yet. Uh, and so just to um, give the punchline of why you might use multiplier, um, the main point is that these machine learning analyses where we reuse data from other settings, so in this case, generic human data from the internet, can give us sort of a level of resolution that was otherwise impossible. Um, Jackie goes into this in great detail in the paper around showing how what if you learn if you build this machine learning model only from data from the rare disease that we were studying, uh, that model is much less detailed and the predictions are much less specific uh, in that it's harder to distinguish. You can say, okay, there's immune high here, but which immune cell types are really driving it is much harder to distinguish. So this is kind of uh, dealt with in, in detail in the paper. Um, but yeah, I would say this is really the methodological um, outcome that you know you would probably be interested in paying attention to. Um, and then now that we have this uh, module library, we call this multiplier, we can then take the modules learned in recount two and apply them to each individual data set. So let's see what that looks like. This is just one example. Again, there's more in the paper. Um, this is an analysis that was remarkably hard to do without this technology. So this is a data set of airway epithelial cells. Um, the composition of each of these is different. The people involved are different. Um, the actual sites that ran the, the samples are different. Um, and this is ordered from most severe form of the disease to least severe form of the disease. And this data set is actually sort of the most severe, this is ANCA associated vasculitis. Um, this goes from sort of uh, GPA active, so the most severe uh, current status through uh, healthy, and then there's some other conditions here. And one of the things you can ask now is you can say which latent variables are consistently associated across data sets. And uh, this M0 macrophage signature was um, one of the most strongly associated with severity across data sets. And this becomes, you know, normally if you were going to pull out an M0 macrophage signature from three different data sets, you'd have to say, okay, is this, mac is this really a macrophage signature in the lung? Is this really the same macrophage signature in the kidney? Is this really the same macrophage signature in the blood? Now, because it's the same latent variable, you're essentially looking at comparable, um, reasonably comparable values across data sets. So this analysis becomes much, much easier to start filtering through and interpreting. And in this case, uh, what we did find is this sort of nice macrophage um, signature associated with severity. And there's another paper now um, digging into sort of what the, some of the potential kind of biological properties are behind these macrophages in particular, and sort of looking into their metabolism as a potential example, uh, explanation of some of what's happening here. Um, you know, you probably don't work on ANCA associated vasculitis, at least uh, it's a rare disease. There's not a huge number of people who work on it, but we do have a good community here at Penn. Um, but you might want to use this model for something else. And so associated with the paper, uh, there's a GitHub repository, which has GitHub notebooks um, that are rendered for essentially everything we did. About two thirds of them probably made it into the paper in some form or fashion. The other third just didn't make it into the paper, including the supplement. Uh, and so there's a lot more here than what was in the paper if you're interested in seeing what we did and how it worked and how you might sort of repurpose it yourselves. And um, just to, to note, uh, yeah, so this work is published. Um, the software, um, the mo machine learning models on Figshare, the software and sort of the notebooks for working with it are all on GitHub. Um, and hopefully um, folks will find this useful. I know I found it useful um, and there are definitely folks in our lab who pulled this model off the shelf and started reusing it in other settings and who find that, you know, what Jackie's dream of sort of this reusable set of modules is really um, quite well realized in, in this, um, sort of thousand latent variables, at least uh, for humans, uh, for human for human data sets. Let's see. Okay, I'm checking the chat. I don't see any questions in the chat. So either y'all are very shy, or uh, I'm not talking too fast, and I'm not uh, using too much jargon. So please, please, please feel free to ask questions in the chat as we go along. Um, okay, so here's the second vignette. How does this actually work? Uh, I'm surprised no one in the chat has asked about batch effects yet. Uh, let's see if I, I can't bring up the participant window, but uh, normally if I were giving this talk in person, I would ask if anyone should think any of this should work or if batch effects should prevent any of it from succeeding. Uh, and we usually think batch effects would, present, would prevent this type of thing from working. 
Um, and so uh, we've had some ideas about this for a little while, but um, we had a student in the lab recently who's done some really nice work uh, putting a bit more of an empirical basis on uh, why this type of cross data set analysis could work. And that student is Alexandra Lee, Alex Lee. Um, so uh, I'll tell you just a quick story of one way that we're using generative neural networks to sort of better understand why these analyses actually work at all. Um, so, you know, I think uh, it's interesting if you work in this space and you read this literature, uh, there's two sort of bifurcate, there's a bifurcation in the literature where you have a set of people who say, um, hey, if you use all public data and you build these models from it, um, these transcriptomic data sets, uh, it's really surprising that these features that you extract really look a lot like biological processes. Um, there's a whole enormous body of literature uh, that has really dealt with the idea that, you know, if you combine multiple data sets, the biggest artifact, the biggest thing you're going to find is technical artifacts. Uh, and so how is it true that you can find biology if you look across all these data sets, even though we know that as you're combining data sets, the technical artifact should destroy the signal. Um, so this is the question that Alex set out to answer. Uh, one of the things we wanted to be able to do was to make entirely new data compendia. Uh, and so she's using a generative neural network approach here called a variational autoencoder. Um, essentially, what she's doing is she's taking a compendia as, compendium as input, um, training an autoencoder, so a neural network that will reduce this to some lower dimensional space in this case, um, and then bring it back out of that lower dimensional space to reconstruct the input data. Um, and in this case, we're using a specific type of, uh, a type of autoencoder called a variational autoencoder, where now we have a mean and, and a, a variance for each of the values in this latent space. We can sample from that, and then we can run just the decoder part of the neural network and we can generate entirely simulated data. Um, so we can do this and then uh, put it on UMAP coordinates. Uh, so this is simulating data from a thousand samples of Pseudomonas aeruginosa data, which is just nice because you can run it on your laptop in a really short amount of time. And you can see the, um, the regions of density for the original data in gray look pretty similar to the regions of density for the simulated data in blue. Maybe we're not quite as great at dealing with some of these weird outlier points, but in general, if there's density in blue, there's also density in gray. Um, for, the, for our purposes, um, this is likely to be sufficient for understanding how these methods work. Um, and so now, because we can generate entirely new data, we can add entirely new technical artifacts. I assume people who reuse all these disparate data sets made by different people for different research purposes are straight up wizards. Oh, I wish, I wish, I wish we had some special amazing skill. Uh, yeah, you'll get to the punchline here, but it turns out we're nothing special, but that's okay. Uh, Cause it means anyone can do this too. Uh, as long as you, as long as you follow some simple rules. Uh, okay, so yeah, so now we can add technical noise. Um, and uh, what that means is then we can sort of add technical noise to separate partitions, combine these together, and now we can create a, a compendium. So this whole collection of a thousand different, a hundred different experiments with, thousand, with about a thousand different samples, but where we can add the technical noise that we want to add. And then we can use sort of various methods to ask if our original data or our, our simulated compendium is similar to uh, the compendium with the noise that we added. Um, and this is pretty fun. So now we can make up genome-wide data, which means uh, if you want to troll your collaborators and make them never work with you again, you can. Uh, so one of the things I asked Alex to, oh, and uh, took out these slides in the interest of time. There's a cool approach in the paper where not only can you generate entirely new samples, but you can generate entirely new experiments that match the experimental design of an existing experiment, but that do, so they preserve the experimental design, but they don't preserve the biology, which is remarkably fun. Um, I took out the details because this paper just got accepted and there's a preprint up. Um, but, um, but yeah, so what that means is you can now generate entirely new genome-wide data. So one of these, uh, I think it's actually the one on the right, is a real data set. Uh, and one of these, which I think is the one on the left, is an artificial generated data set. Um, they look pretty darn similar. Uh, so one of them is the template, the other one is the one that's generated from the template. Um, and then you can send them to your collaborators and be a horrible person, which is, hey, uh, you know, I've got this experiment uh, that's perturbing, uh, you know, it has a perturbation in it, and here's the top 10 differentially expressed genes. Can you tell me what it is? Uh, and then this is a, a, someone from a shared Slack channel we have, but I feel really bad about doing this now, but I really wanted to know if this worked. Uh, this person says, oh, I love a good mystery or the efflux bumps being affected, you know, this loss of function then because it's this. Uh, and so like you can actually start to build biological stories around data sets that don't exist anywhere. 
Um, and, you know, we didn't, and we show in the paper that like, if you just do this with random samples combined, you don't get these types of statistical associations. But if you use this sort of uh, experimental design preserving manipulation of the latent space, you can actually do this. So that's kind of fun. We can now make uh, entirely new experiments de novo. Uh, from a forensic bioinformatics standpoint, this is uh, probably something we should start to also think about working on. How do you detect it when people are making up entirely fake genome-wide data? Um, but uh, at the moment, we're just using it to better understand how you can combine data sets. Um, okay, so if you do this, uh, now we can understand why half the literature says you can't do this, and well, probably 90% of the literature says you can't do this, and 10% of the literature says you can do this. Um, so this, is a, this here is SVCCA. Um, it's essentially a way to ask if one data set, well, one, yeah, let's say one data set in this case, because that's how we're using it, is similar to another data set given that one can be a rotation of the other. So it's essentially a little bit of a forgiving way to ask if two data sets are similar. Um, we can do this two ways. So because we're adding technical noise, we can use a perfect method for removing that noise, uh, which is this with correction approach. So this is like the perfect method to remove noise because we know what the noise model is. Um, we can also do the same thing, but just not remove any noise. <laughs> fake news on fake data. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so you can see if you do correction, so if you try to correct for these technical artifacts, in general, because we're using a perfect noise model, uh, we can do a pretty good job of removing uh, technical artifacts. If you do no correction, uh, your signal is pretty much destroyed here. We're using a really high amount of noise. And so uh, this, 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 I should say, this dotted line is a random perturbation of your data. So like, you're not that far off a random perturbation of your data with the amount of noise we're adding here. But you know you can beautifully remove it with the right method. Um, however, the interesting thing happens when you start to get out to really large numbers of experiments. So here, this is 600 different simulated experiments combined. And you can now see that not doing correction is actually better than correcting. Uh, and that's really kind of surprising. Um, you know, where this crossover point between the two actually happens is going to depend a lot on your assumptions about how much noise there actually is and sort of what those noise models are. So I wouldn't take uh, a specific crossover point as like the given as, oh, beyond that point, don't do correction, under that point, do do correction. Um, but I would really say there, you know, I think what you should believe is that there is some point where correction no longer helps you. And if you're looking at hundreds of different experiments, you're probably somewhere near, if not past that point, and you might want to think about trying uh, to do something without correcting and sort of see what things look like. Um, okay, so yeah, so it turns out, uh, I think Morgan asked uh, or, or said we were wizards. I wish we were wizards. Uh, when we did this the first time, uh, we were shocked at how well it worked. That was back in 2012 or 13. A student in my group, Chia Tan, did this, and it just like, the results were beautiful. It was unbelievable. Um, and we kind of guessed this was what was going on, but we didn't have a way to really understand it. Um, now, what we can say more conclusively based on Alex's work with these generative neural networks, since we can now simulate a whole large amount of this data, is that these compendia-wide analyses can actually work um, largely because there's some underlying consistent signal, which is sort of often going to be more biological, and the technical noise is hopefully going to be relatively experiment-specific. Uh, we just heard that this paper was accepted yesterday, so congrats to Alex. Uh, that's wonderful news. Um, the code for this is on GitHub. Um, there's also a package called Panyo, um, which we refactored out of this. So now if you want to simul simulate your own data using these variational autoencoders, uh, you can do that. Um, and we're now using that for a couple other cool things, uh, projects that build on this that I didn't have time to, to talk about. But um, yeah, I'm really excited. I think the ability to generate new data and sort of understand uh, how you can use it is kind of a fun technology um, for genome-wide gene expression. It's been possible before, but um, this sort of variational autoencoder approach just makes it so simple um, without having to make a lot of strong assumptions. Okay, and then in the final bit of this, I just want to talk about some work that um, we've done relatively recently to understand uh, how uh, equitably we distribute honors in our field. Uh, and we were interested in the question a little bit more broadly than our field, but we use computational biology as a case study because we are computational biologists. And I thought you might find it interesting because I suspect many of you are also computational biologists. Um, so we use the International Society for Computational Biology, which I know some people were at ISMB um, and are, and, um, you know, are aware of it. Uh, so it's a scholarly society. It's supposed to be a worldwide uh, effort. Um, and uh, it's supposed to be 
uh, dedicated to uh, really improving uh, the sort of field of computational biology. Um, diversity is a core value. You know, this is a society that's really trying to do um, everything it can do right. Um, and so we wanted to understand, you know, how does a society that's trying to do its best actually do? Uh, and one of the things we wanted to understand were how honors are distributed because, you know, I think the people we choose to honor tell us a lot about ourselves, right? Um, so, and thinking about sort of how science happens, um, we're evaluated by our peers all the time. For honors, we're evaluated. For grants, we're evaluated and our science is evaluated. For papers, it's supposed to be our science that's evaluated, but there's a large number of, uh, there's a pretty big body of literature that suggests that both the people and the papers are evaluated. Um, and because science is so self-governing, I think honors can reveal a lot about what we value. Um, you know, I think uh, there's, we see this a lot in, uh, so this is the US National Institutes of Health, uh, looked at um, award success rates and, under, and tried to understand why minority scientists were not as successful in their grant applications. And their takeaway was that minority scientists were tending to apply for awards on topics with lower success rates. But because science is so peer evaluation based, if you are not a, major, a member of sort of uh, the majority of a, if you are a, my, if your work is um, coming from a perspective that's not recognized uh, by a large portion of the study section, you know, as, as critically important, your work might be devalued unfairly. Um, and so, you know, one potential implication is that minority scientists are applying for awards in areas with lower success rates, but a similar, uh, similarly compatible um, interpretation with the findings is that reviewers might not actually be recognizing the scientific importance of these topics appropriately. And so we thought, you know, using that as a jumping off point and trying to understand if we were evaluating scientific importance in a way that negatively influenced sort of diversity, if that was, um, that's really the question we wanted to go after. And so we thought that directly measuring peer recognition could help to disentangle this. Um, so what did we do? Uh, we curated about 400 honorees, uh, keynote speakers at major computational biology meetings. I suspect many of you have been to ISMB or RECOM. Um, these are kind of meetings that have a global reach. Um, and we also looked at ISCB fellows. So this is an honor bestowed by the society. Um, so we tried to establish a field specific background. We've now done this uh, multiple ways because peer reviewers, it turns out, uh, care a lot about what your field specific background is. Uh, We've, so we've done it using sort of uh, journals that are heavily associated with computational biology as a background, using 30,000 articles from them. Uh, the, work, the work that I'm going to present today is using 150,000 papers, which is essentially everything uh, in PubMed with a mesh heading uh, that's associated to computational biology or bioinformatics or similar. Um, we built an automated processing pipeline. So from each of these, we can extract the author name, the position, uh, the author position, any affiliations, and we can map those affiliations to countries. Um, we also have some other stuff we developed to do this, but we'll start first with gender. Um, we wanted to estimate gender. Uh, we used something called genderize.io. It's a service trained on more than 100 million uh, named gender pairings. You can query with a first name, so in this case, Casey, uh, and get a probability back. And so um, in this case, uh, I would get, I got back 74% chance of being male. Um, we actually really didn't want to binarize uh, gender, so we use this continuous probability. And then we ask about sort of collections of both honorees and authors. Um, and we used uh, all 409, IS we got uh, 409 ISCB honorees and about 150,000 senior authors that we could estimate um, gender from. And uh, just to note, uh, we treat, we do not collapse authors. So if you have two publications as senior author, you have twice the representation in this data set. If you have five publications as senior author, you have five times the representation in this data set, which we thought was really important if you're comparing to honorees, because we think those honorees are likely to be the ones who have sort of more overall contributions. Um, so these are the results. There's a couple ways to take these. So this is looking at gender. Um, so PubMed authors, uh, the sort of estimated female proportion has been increasing uh, over time. Uh, the keynote speaker fellow, uh, so sort of the honorees were kind of maybe a little bit flat for a while, but have sort of had points of uh, where there's sort of a kind of marked increase a little bit. Um, you could see this two ways. Uh, we, in our paper, uh, saw it as, wow, we are not at parity and we are not really on pace to get there anytime soon. Um, 
other, uh, you know, uh, certain, we also got reviews uh, on this paper that suggested that we did not appropriately recognize how well ISCD was doing. Uh, and so, you know, I think there's, this could be a glass half full or a glass half, em half empty scenario. Uh, I guess the good news is it's not worse uh, than what we see in the literature, but um, somewhat disappointing that this is what I would like to see a society that's trying to lead in this area, um, sort of really aim for thinking about what an appropriate distribution is and then trying to get there um, as opposed to sort of, you know, leading instead of following, I think is important. Um, this also might be a little bit optimistic. Um, the proportion of women as last authors is, uh, there's some literature that suggests is lower than the proportion of those receiving grants. So um, if women are not included as last authors, that would downweigh their inclusion in our background distribution. Uh, and so that would make uh, things look better than they actually are. Um, and it's also important to note, this is what I also mentioned before, that this is measuring diversity, not equity. Um, and so uh, somewhat perversely, anything that reduced the fraction of women as senior authors uh, would make the honoree pool look more representative. Uh, and so this is one of the reasons that I think in this evaluation, really striving for parity is more important than striving for sort of um, directly matching the, the literature contribution. Um, and then, you know, we also wanted to dive to dig a little bit further. So uh, we wanted to understand if there were certain uh, groups of people who weren't being recognized. Uh, so we, because we do machine learning on everyone else's data, decided to train a neural network to predict name origin groups. Uh, we scraped English language Wikipedia for living persons, ended up with 100, 000, uh, sorry, 700,000 name, quote unquote, nationality pairs. Um, we grouped them using this sort of name prism, which is a machine learning derived grouping. And then we trained a neural network to predict these groups. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't dive into it too much detail, but I'll just say um, the sensitivity is the specificity are pretty good for this um, in, in, for the most part. Um, and you know, I know calibration came up in the previous talk. We did look at calibration and the model calibration um, tends to look reasonable, for, especially for the groups that are reasonably large and the confusion matrices look okay. Um, if you do this, then what you can do is start to look at the honorees. Um, and so what we can do is again, look at the PubMed authors. So this is our background distribution look at the keynote speakers and fellows. And if you uh, look at this for not too long, you can see there's one thing that really just sticks out. And that's that um, this sort of bright green color here uh, is much less apparent in the keynote speakers and fellows and is a much larger and growing part of the biomedical literature. And these are authors that have names that we predicted to be, um, have an East Asian name origin. Um, you can also see there are other disparities here if you really dive into it, but I think, uh, and. Uh, we actually have the results in the paper with nice confidence intervals around them if you want to see it. But essentially the, the headline message is we are, ISCB uh, is really, really not honoring uh, East, uh, scientists with East Asian name origins at the same proportion that um, those scientists are contributing to the literature in our field. Um, you know, one thing we get asked, we got asked when we first presented these results is, is this just geography? Uh, so is it just that we're not recognizing people from countries in East Asia, um, that might be part of it. So uh, this is asking for each country, if uh, there are more honorees than you expect based on contributions to the biomedical literature. Uh, so the United States has 154, roughly, uh, more honorees than you expect based on their contributions to the biomedical literature. China, on the other hand, has 70 fewer. Um, and you can see there are some countries for which there's sort of an overabundance, and then uh, a number of countries also for which there's a, a depletion. So, so this might you know, address some of why this is happening is there might just be geographic disparities. Um, so then we asked, well, what if you did this only within the US? So if we only took authors uh, with a US affiliation, what, does, what do things look like? Um, and again, uh, even when you look only in the US, um, this is using our name origin predictor. You can again see there's this depletion. Um, we also uh, use self-identification from a uh, predictor based on US census uh, data and uh, essentially the same result uh, persists. Every way we look at these, uh, we've been asked many, many different times by many different reviewers to look at these in many different ways. And every way we look, uh, this is just consistent. Um, I will say, uh, you know, I don't think this is malicious. I think this was probably an oversight for the most part. Um, and so uh, we pre-printed this work um, back at the beginning of this year. And since then there've been sort of new uh, keynotes announced to so the ISMB keynotes. Um, and the ISCB fellows were announced. Um, these honorees uh, look different uh, in terms of how we classify them in our predictor um, and include actually the first uh, ISCB fellow from uh, mainland China. So um, I thought that was uh, an interesting change and suggests that maybe um, simply presenting a society with these types of 
limitations of their honoree pool might be sufficient in certain cases to lead to an improvement in uh, diversity and ho hopefully ultimately equity. Um, yeah, and so this is that point. You know, really, uh, what we can measure here is diversity, but we can't really. We're not fully measuring equity, um, and so keeping in mind that you know matching the distribution that we see is sort of maybe going to get you diversity that matches the sort of contributions to the field, but because people face different barriers, I think for honors, what we should really strive for is equity. Um, and you know, it's this is actually remarkably important in science. You know, we want to think. Uh, that we are all objective and not biased and we're very rational people, but um, science is self-governing. So where we do have biases, uh, they are uh, pernicious and quite uh, harmful. So really, I think measuring these is really important and hopefully we have a new tool to do that. Um, so Trang Lee, Dr. Lee is the postdoc who led this work um, here at Penn. And then um, this is up now as a Manubot manuscript if you want to look at it. Um, there's also a GitHub repository associated with the analysis if you want to take that code and run it yourself. Um, so with that, I want to thank the people who make this possible. Um, the work, so I talked about work from Jacqueline Taroni, who's now a data scientist in the Childhood Cancer Data Lab. Um, I want to note uh, Alex Lee, uh, who's a grad student in the group who talked about, who led the second story, and Trang, uh, who's actually a postdoc in a different lab here at Penn, but who was really excited about this project and led it up. Um, and so they, they were the people who led up that, that work. Um, I'd love to thank the folks who funded it, and I'd be happy to take questions that y'all have.